In this video, we'll go through what will basically be our first online class. But just before we jump into the actual material, there's just a few things that I want to point out about the book itself. Overall, in this first video, there's going to be a lot of me talking and me pointing to particular things in the textbook. I know we talked about this in class. Not everybody has the textbook yet. So a couple of these things, like especially these early things I talk about, when you do get your book, the end of this week, next week, even the week after, couple of good things to look over to, again, set the right expectations, understand how the book works. But again, for this first one, I'll be pointing, you'll have the pages in the video itself, so you could pause if you want to read, look at it a little more, and I'll include the homework pages as separate PDF files so that you can get started. So the very first thing I wanted to point out in our book is before you even get too deep, if you look in our prologue section, P4, they give a nice little section about misconceptions about mathematics. That, you know, as we were talking the other day about, you know, just how to study and some of these other factors, I probably should have also acknowledged that, you know, a lot of people have this fear about math. There's a lot of, you know, we'll talk about test anxiety at different points, but for a lot of people, it kind of comes from a lot of earlier places that people think, well, you know, you have to have a math brain. You know, math is just too complex. Math makes you less sensitive. There's no room for creativity. I mean, all these things, uh, I mean, this is kind of nice. There are some problems, like some people like math because there are exact answers instead of like opinion type questions. But there's other aspects to math that's not quite so clear cut. Math is irrelevant. That's not even close to true. It's okay to be bad at math. This is one that for me personally, it's, it's so problematic that so many people, that our entire society, it's almost like we've established. It's okay. Math is hard, so it's okay to be bad at math. I understand we have our strengths and weaknesses, but that just acknowledges, that just makes it okay for people to say, oh, I'm bad at it, and so is everybody else. And that's becoming a bigger and bigger problem. So I just think for some of you, that's nice to quickly read through. They then go into what is mathematics. But the next thing I wanted to point out is this section. P9, how to succeed in mathematics. And they specifically talk about using this book. I think this is definitely worth a read. Just a couple of pages. One of the first things that they mention is one of the first things we talked about, budgeting your time. What should you be thinking about per week? We have a three credit class. You should be reading the textbook. Like we were saying in class, that is a good part of study. Homework problems, of course you're gonna be doing that. Some extra review and test preparation, but reading is also a part of that. This is a very solid book, and you'll see in a few more minutes, I really try and use it to enhance the class. Not as something that's in the way, not as something that's extra, but that it all goes together. So they have some quick tips for studying, some quick tips for preparing for exams, and again, several of these things we mentioned, it's not just doing more problems, reviewing your notes, reminding yourself relevant sections, relevant terms. Today, we're going to start talking about statistics. The beginning of statistics, very, very little computation. You know, especially today's class, it's just going to be a lot of identifying. What is the situation? What are the key terms? So it's not just doing homework problems. We don't have any writing assignments, so we don't have to worry about that part. But again, just a few things that I wanted to point out. Now, when we get into our first lesson, again, we're talking about the fundamentals of statistics. That's where we begin today. But just before I jump in and get started, the last little thing about the book. Again, it's nice. Our book is very organized. When you get to the homework, I just want to point out they always have a quick quiz. I won't assign these problems, but the answers for all the quick quiz problems are in the back of your book. It's not a bad idea. Just a quick thing to remind yourself on what some of the key ideas, but I'll be getting our uh, homework problems from the exercises. And you'll notice all these little separate sections. This set of directions for these problems. This set of directions for these problems. If I don't give you a problem from a particular set, that's, a, a, that's me showing you that that's not going to come up. 
When we think about our test questions, when we get to that point, our test questions are going to very closely mimic the problems that we've done from the homework. So if I don't assign homework problems from this section, for example, well, then you shouldn't expect any test problems from that section. And also when you read, the book will talk a little bit about this, but if there's no homework problems with it, you could see that that's not something I'm prioritizing. Okay, so now let's jump in. Because again, this first section, when we start talking about just basic statistics, the beginning of this almost has more of like a history class as, you know, here are some terms, here are some ideas, being able to identify. Again, there's not gonna be any real arithmetic. So the rest of this video, we'll go through 5A, we'll go through 5B. Again, I will post the homework that goes with that. Collectively, that will be homework assignment number one. And again, I'll also post the PDF files for those of you who don't have the book yet. So definitely want to use the video, take some good notes, and you'll have the homework. And then when you do get the book, still a good idea to go back and flip through some extra reinforcement. So the fundamentals of statistics. The first thing is that we want to realize is that there formally are two definitions to the word statistics. The first part is the broad field of statistics. And when we talk about that, either statistics as a class or again, statistics as a field, it is the science of collecting, organizing, and interpreting data. Now, just to be clear, I'm not going to ever have any vocabulary sections on tests, but being familiar with the terminology is very often the key to solving these first problems. So that's just going to be good to have in mind. What is statistics? It's not just a random collection of data. There is a science behind it. This is not random information we're collecting. We have a tested ability to say things with certain percentages, with certain convictions. So we'll get to more of that later. But then secondly, when we also refer to statistics, a lot of people use that to refer to the data or the other collection of values. So just to jump ahead without getting too deep into what statistics is, let's say I'm using, you know, we've taken a test and I'm using all of your test scores as data items. Well, then some of the things we'll do with that data, we'll figure out the average test score. That average test score is technically one of the statistics that goes with that set of data. So that's where you hear the words used interchangeably a lot. One referring to the greater field of statistics and the second referring to the data and all those other values that go with it. I mean, especially people who follow sports, we hear people talk about, you know, football stats, baseball stats. Some of those using the word statistics is a little over the top because it's just pure data. But other things do get into what do you use that data for? How can we get something out of that information? So they give us a nice little paragraph about how statistics works. And basically the idea is that statistics can be applied to almost anything. You know, there are just so many areas where we collect data. And then once you have that data, what do you do with it? What does it tell you? What other information can we learn? What uh, decisions might that influence? All that gets connected. So they start off talking about just a little TV rating system, but I mean everything talking about, again, there's so many examples when it comes to politics, favorability of different legislature or different personalities. When you get into, you know, consumer products, there's so much data about, well, you know, let's say you're buying a new television or a new car. There's so much data available about first just price. Secondly, you could start talking about quality and other ways to quantitatively measure and say, well, this TV is better than that TV, or that this car has a better gas mileage than that car. Other ways that we want to have information to make a decision. What is the best car for us to buy? What is the best house for us to buy? Uh, if you're in business, I mean, so much information about consumer products, like similar to what we were just saying about cars and houses, but more so, maybe it's about efficiency of your workers. Maybe you're trying to look at better ways to uh, be more productive in your manufacturing process. I mean, again, we could just keep going on and on about all the different areas where we'd collect data. But one of the first things that we have to establish 
is once we have something in mind, we need to break down what we call the population versus the sample. The population is the complete set. What are we studying? What is every object or person that would be involved in that field of study? That would be your population. The sample would then be a subset of that entire population. Now, very quickly, some people, why bother making the distinction? If I want to know about an entire group of objects or people, why don't I just study all of those objects or people? Well, the answer, one of the first answers, is often just time. How many people are we talking about? If we're trying to talk about, doesn't matter which way you break it down, let's look at something about all the people in the United States. You've got over 300 million people that you'd have to be collecting information from. That's just ridiculous. That's so, so difficult. Not to mention, you know, costly. You'd have to hire people to collect that information, compile it for you, the time-consuming aspect of it, how long it would take to get all that information. You know, just while we're talking about that, this connects to the census. We do the census every 10 years because we try and get all that information from everybody, and it's just such a very difficult process. So just practically speaking, that's often why we're looking at a sample. You may say, okay, well, maybe we don't care about the whole United States. Maybe we just want to look at New York State. When I've got over 20 million people, still way too many. Okay, you only care about New York City. When I have 9 million people, still way too many. You only care about one borough. It doesn't matter how small you break it down. Those types of examples still have just way, way too many people to practically get everybody for every type of question that you'd want to collect information for. So that's one reason why we sample. Another quick thing, if we're talking about products, you know, maybe we're trying to test our new car to test its gas mileage. Well, we wouldn't want to use every car that we make. We want to sell our cars. So maybe we just, you know, we pick a sample of the cars to test so that we have all the others still available for sale. So that's the big picture from our first two terms. The population is every person or object that is being studied, every person or object of interest, and a sample is a simple subset of that. So we'll do some little population versus sampling questions. That'll be one of our first situations. But just to explain that a little bit more, when we talk about a sample, no matter what your population is, there are always so many ways to break things down into a sample. So maybe we're looking at a local high school, for instance. How can you break down samples if you're looking at all of the high school students? Well, maybe you do care about all the high school students, but maybe there are situations that you only care about maybe the varsity athletes. So the varsity athletes would make up a sample of the entire population of students. Maybe we only care about freshmen. The freshman students would be a sample of all the students. Maybe it's about age. Maybe we only want to look at students who are eligible to drive. So we only want to look at students who have a driver's license. Or we only want to look at a specific age group. Uh, age group. We only want to look at 15-year-olds. Or maybe we only want to look at men. Or maybe we only want to look at women. So anytime you talk about a population, there are always lots of ways to think of different samples, different types of samples. So we'll still come back and do a population versus sample. But again, the big picture is whatever they're talking about, the population is everybody. And the sample just consists of the people that they're the people the objects that they're actually using in the study itself. The people or objects that they're actually collecting data from. So the next big part, what is the statistical process? You know, this is where a lot of people who don't fully understand statistics, they go, okay, well, statistics is about data. So step one, you have data. Step two, you do something with data. And that's, that's such a huge jump. So again, just going back to the beginning, before you could even start talking about data, you have to identify a goal. What question, what topic, what is it that we care about in the first place? What is it that we're trying to figure out? It's such an overlooked part. Again, people wanna jump right in, but we have to start with, well, what do we care about? 
So let's start off by stating the goal of your study. Once you have that goal established, well then you can kind of naturally see who the population is. The goal of my study is to figure out how uh, the connection between high school students who have a driver's license and their overall academic performance. That's, that might be some topic. I mean, there's so many other things we could go where so many different directions. The goal is to figure out what is the best television for me. The goal is to figure out which candidate represents, best represents my interests in the next election. The goal is to figure out what strategy should my company take to, you know, better improve work or efficiency or to improve our profits or our sales. You know, there's so many, as we keep pointing out in the first place, there's so many places that you could collect data and statistics could be used because there's so many different goals and things we may want to know. But once you have that goal, then we could think about the population. Well, the population are these students who have their driver's license. The population is my entire workforce. The population is my sales for the past year. Now, now we can start getting to what we call a representative sample. Now we want to start getting our sampling and start getting our information. We've established the question in mind. We know who the entire population is. So before we try and go after everybody, let's think about a sample. But this word representative sample, we're going to eventually get to the idea of bias in sampling and just bias in statistics. These are sometimes intentionally done by people to try and get data that supports their idea and not the idea that is supported by everyone, for example. But the idea of a representative sample, your sample should look like your population. If my sample is supposed to be um, all high school students, I'm sorry, if my population is supposed to be all the students in a particular high school, but then when I start sampling and I notice everybody in my sample is a freshman, that's not a representative sample. That would be a representative sample of the freshman class. Now, it doesn't have to be a perfect, well, you know, 22% of our students are seniors, 32% of them are juniors, and that's the way the sample should break down, but it should be in the right ballpark. That if we have a even split of, you know, men versus women, then our sample should hopefully have a fairly close split of men versus women. If we have a fairly equally distributing of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, well, then our sample would hopefully have a, you know, a, a representative, a close to idea of equally parts of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors. So that's what we mean by representative sample. So you've established your goal, you've determined the entire population, now you're thinking about a good sample, and now you're actually getting the data from that sample, and this is where we get our basic summary. Then we start to use that summary to start to make some inferences. If we know something about the sample, what does that tell me about the entire population? Sometimes this might just be that our information is supporting what we thought in the first place. Other times it might be a little bit more involved, but that's where we're going with that. And then last, we draw our conclusions. I want to nitpick this for a moment. This is a good outline, but at the very end, this almost makes, and this kind of goes along with, we'll mention this a little more in class, the idea that once we start getting statistics and establishing what statistics can do for us, now some people go over the top with it. They think once they have any amount of information, that proves everything. They use this tiny amount of data to make this grand sweeping conclusion. That's a little troublesome, and that's something we're having more issues with as a society. We need to, at the end, it's not just drawing a conclusion, determine what you've learned. You really, really have to get to that next part of, are there any limitations? Is there something like, you know, we'll get a little bit into this. Maybe there are other variables that are influencing this, and I need to run more experimentation to know my results are true. You know, I mean, if we're going to talk about the COVID vaccine or just COVID treatments, you see some people talking about these, um, these treatments and protocols that are not approved by the CDC. 
but they think they have a tiny bit of data and it supports what they want. And therefore to them, that proves that this treatment works. But that's not enough, right? You need conclusions to know, well, what are the other factors? I read uh, this story about this one person talking about how this worked great and two weeks later they felt great. It's like, well, two weeks later, a lot of people are fully healed. So maybe your treatment had nothing to do with you getting better. It was just simply your body fighting off the COVID infection. So that's where just at the very end, we're not going to do big sweeping statistical surveys, but just to realize this last step, they should expand on that just a little bit more talking about, are there any limitations? Are there any other extensions that we can do? Is there more we can look into that would better support our results? Here they just draw a nice little flow chart. Again, same idea. You're getting starting, you're identifying your goals. That leads to your population. From your population, you're thinking about and getting a sample. You're collecting your data and summarizing some of that data from your sample, making some inferences from your sample about the entire population, and then trying to draw some conclusions about that population. So then, you know, they talk a little bit about choosing a sample. This is where you'll notice, this is what I was saying, I kind of skipped over this homework. We want the idea of a representative sample. We want to be able to look at a population and say, wow, that sample, that doesn't seem right. You know, that's again, we're talking about if I wanted to know about the people in my neighborhood and, you know, how much income they have, and I only ask the two neighbors across the street from me. Or maybe same question, I'm looking at the wealth of my neighborhood, but then I go to the five biggest houses and ask them how much money they make, and I try and use that to talk about the entire rest of my neighborhood who don't have the same size house. So that's again, every time we look at a sample, we should do that little self-check. Does that seem right? Now at this stage, you need experience to know that. So especially when you get to these questions in the homework, take advantage of the answers in the back of the book, right? Maybe you do look at that and say, huh, yeah, that seems good to me. That doesn't seem like there's a problem. And the back of the book points something out to you. Now that's something new for you to incorporate. Like, oh, I didn't think of that before. It's such an overlooked aspect of math that having experience really, really can guide us for later problems. So again, make sure you're getting good practice with this. Now, how do you sample? Again, the idea is to get a representative sample. So how can you do that? Well, some people just try random sampling, okay? You know, if we do random sampling, every item has an equal chance of being selected. So hopefully that would lead to a nice representative sample. Similarly, systematic sampling. If I ask every 10th student who walks in the door, at the end of the day, there's a decent chance I'll end up with a representative sample of my entire school. This is where you can start getting into trouble. Convenience sampling, a sample who's convenient. Well, okay, maybe I choose a sample that's convenient, so like my class, but then that's where I may have to step and think, step back and think a little more. If I'm only polling, say, a Calculus two class, would that be a good sample for the entire college? Maybe, but maybe not. Not a lot of students get to calculus too, so maybe that's not the best class. Maybe if I want something that's gonna give me more of the entire college, I wanna think more about sampling from a class that almost everybody takes. That might be a better way. And then stratified sampling. So again, you'll notice, I'm going through this quickly, because I'm not going to ask you to separate these. I just want you to be aware of the different types of sampling and to realize that, you know, I mean, they've got this funny little graphic over here, convenience sampling, just yelling out the window to random people, asking them a question and their answer. I don't think you're going to get the best results by doing that. So that's just the direction we're going. So now we introduce the term bias, okay? Bias. Statistical study can suffer from bias if its design or conduct tends to favor certain results. This is a major problem with statistics. So this is where, like I'm saying, even when sometimes people have statistics and they're trying to impress their results on us to say, well, this data shows that I am correct. Well, one of the big things we can always go back and ask, well, okay, 
Who did you talk to? How did you get that information? Because the way you collect your information can lead to bias. So for instance, if I want to know what people think about abortion and I come out and say, oh, look at this, my survey shows everybody is opposed to abortion. But then I look deeper and I say, who did I survey? And you look and realize you only surveyed old white men. That's bias. Those old white men do not, well, who is our population here? Are we looking at all people? Are we looking at citizens? Are we looking at New York's, uh, New York City? But no matter which way you look at it, if I only had old white men, that would not be a representative sample and would therefore be introducing bias. It wouldn't be my survey shows everyone supports abortion. It would be my survey seems to indicate old white men support abortion. So that's one spot. A second thing that comes up with bias is the question itself. How are you asking your question? There are a lot of key words people can use that already have positive or negative connotation. If you're asking a question that is already positively or negatively influenced, you're going to influence the answers you get from people. If I say to you, what do you think of the Democrats' disastrous plan to raise taxes on the rich? By saying things like disastrous, I'm already influencing you like, oh, disaster? That's terrible. I think their plan is a bad idea. But a neutral way would be to ask, what do you think of the Democrats' plan to increase taxes on the higher earning incomes, on the rich people? That's neutral. That would be the better way to ask the question. So I asked one with negative bias. Similarly, I could do positive. You know, I could say about what do you think about the great Tom Brady and his Hall of Fame career? Well, you know, by using words like great, by already stating that he's a Hall of Fame player, again, I'm already influencing you in a positive way. So that's just a couple of places. Again, I'm giving a lot of information here. And you're going to wonder about like with the types of questions, but already starting to think the biggest thing so far is to get familiar with the terminology so that you could separate population versus sample. That would be the first bunch of questions. There's, I think, one homework question that tries to give you a situation to get you to go through the five steps of what you know, if I give you this topic, where would you go from here to try and get you to think about who the population would be, who, um, how you would then sample based off of that population. So it's just trying to get you in the, the right mode of thinking. We don't have too many big questions yet. And certainly on Monday, we're going to go through and do several of these questions as extra practice. So let's just keep going. They then get a little different. Uh, a little deeper here, the types of statistical study and observational study where you're just observing, measuring, but you're not attempting to influence or modify these characteristics. So you're just trying to collect some information, how people feel, what they think, basic information. In an experiment, you're applying a treatment to some or a sample of the members and then observing the effects of the treatment. So it's like an observational study is just kind of I don't want to say passively exactly, but that's sort of it. You're passively collecting data. Here, you're a little more hands-on. And that's where you've probably heard things like a treatment group and a control group. If you're testing in that experiment fashion, you need to test both. You're giving people, so again, think about COVID for a moment. I've got a new vaccine. Well, how do I know that vaccine works? I can't just give it to everybody. I give everybody the vaccine, but then I also have a control group who do not receive the treatment. And I measure the effects based off each other. If the control group has the same good positive results that the treatment group has, well, that might give me the indication there's some other variable or factor that's helping, but it's not my new vaccine or my new treatment. If I see the treatment group does very well while the control group does not, that might be a better indication that my treatment is, is on the right track. Again, just another quick word. Hopefully you've all heard of the placebo effect. That's why we need to do things like this. Okay, that's why we need a control group. The human mind is very funny. 
and that some people you may be given, you know, you think you're getting a new treatment and you just get better because of like, you know, positive thinking, so to speak. So that's just a little reason. There's some real reasoning why we have to break this down and we can't just give everybody the treatment. We need to see what happens when people think they're getting the treatment, but are not. All right. So again, then they've got just a little bit more about case control study. But the last thing that we really need from this section is the idea of the margin of error. That there's a lot of situations where we'd like to construct what we call a confidence interval. This is that extension of taking sample data and extend it to an entire population. So we could do this with percentages, we can do this with averages, all different situations. The book mostly focuses on percentages at this point, but I could do it with averages. If I say I have one statistics class and they scored an average of an 81 on the last exam, well, I can assume my other stats classes will probably also have something similar to an 81 average on that test. But if I told you they had a margin of error of four points, you would take the average and subtract that margin of error and then take the average and add that margin of error. And that would give you a window. And that window would represent the rest of the stats classes. So again, if one stats class had an 81 average with a margin of error of four points, we could say all stats classes, 81 minus four would be 77, 81 plus four would be 85, all stats classes we would assume would be getting between a 77 and 85 on average. That's the idea of a confidence interval. Let's do it with percentages. And you know, they've got a few different like runoff questions here. Let's, let's do something different. Let's say 92% um, of, of the Queensboro population attended class on the first day with a margin error of two points. What can we say about all CUNY students and what percentage that attended the first class? Well, at QCC, our sample, we had 92%. There's the sample statistic. We are given a margin of error of 2%. So 92 minus two would be 90. That would be the bottom of our interval. 92 plus two would be 94. That would be the top. And we could say all CUNY students attended first day at a rate between 90 and 94%. The last thing on this first section is to realize we could work backwards. If you knew the margin of error, I'm sorry, if you knew the confidence interval, you could then figure out the sample statistic and margin of error. So if I told you, I figured out there is a confidence interval for students that smoke cigarettes and we get 15 to 23 percent. Okay, let me even jot this down quickly. So I tell you, we've got 15 percent. I'm sorry, what I said, 15 to 23 percent smoke cigarettes. And I want to go in reverse. I want to know what is the sample statistic and what is the margin of error? How few people can, you know, we could see this in a few different ways, but to just realize basing it off the formula, I could really make a literal 15 equals the sample minus the margin of error, 23 equals the sample plus the margin of error, I could make a literal system of equations and solve and figure out what is the sample stat, what is the margin of error. But for a lot of us, we can just do this more practically. To get the sample stat, notice how we went above and below by the same margin. So the sample stat is just the average of the two. So some people could just figure it out, go in the middle, and this one works out to be a nice whole number. But if it worked out to be a decimal, a little technique, just to average them. So I'll add the two together, and then I'll divide by two, and my sample statistic would be in my sample, I found 19% of the students were, smoke, were cigarette smokers. 
Well, what's the margin of error? Well, 19, again, you can go back here and be very literal and get something like 15 equals 19 minus E and solve for E, or 23 equals 19 plus E. Don't have to use both here. You could use either one of these and solve for E. Or again, just think practically. How do you get from 19 to 15? How do you get from 19 to 23? Here you subtracted four, here you added four, so the margin of error would then be 4%. So that's it from this first section. That's 5A. We are going to do 5B, but you'll notice 5B is pretty, pretty quick. Okay, A lot of basic terminology. Again, we only did a couple of problems. Look through the homework, get started. But on Monday, that's where we're going to start class. A quick review on some of the basic terms to make sure we're on the right track and then a few problems to reinforce what is the population, what is the sample, and then getting a little deeper thinking about the statistical st process, and then margin of error and confidence intervals. So for today, and again, I'll show you, so your homework is gonna be, uh, I'll, I'll include it in the email. It's page 297, number nine, 15 through 21 odd, 27, 47, 49, 55, and 57. All that starts over here. Sorry, page 297. Homework starts down here, but then it continues to the next pages. And like I said, it's not everything. You notice I always gave the odds, so that way you have the answers in the back. But now to go into 5B. Should you believe a statistical study? An excellent question. And again, this will be fairly quick. A lot of this is, for, just so you realize, this is like the first two weeks, maybe even a little bit more in a full stats class to get the full background, to get all these ideas. Because in a stats class, we take a lot of this deeper. But for us, like I was saying, even though stats is a good chunk of our class, all the units we look at, it's really just to get a taste. So we get a good taste from all these sections. So that's why, again, Basically, knowing your vocab, getting some basic uh, questions and answers, and you're good from 5A. And we'll see that similar here in 5B. So, should you believe a statistical study? Well, they have several guidelines. I mean, they've got eight guidelines over here, and then they really go through each one individually. But, I mean, I really got to say, guideline number one is so important. Get a big picture view of the study. Should you believe a study? Well, first off, you should know what the goal of the study was. Before you get the conclusions and the answers, what was the goal in the first place? What was the population? Was that population clearly and appropriately defined? Knowing a little bit more about the type of study being done. So that's the first big thing. But just going through the eight big steps, getting the big picture view, understanding the goal, what they were going for, and where they got it, Considering the source, what type of question were they asking? Who was the sample? Is there any possibility for bias? And then they even expand that. Is there bias in the, sam in the sample? Was the sampling method likely to produce a representative sample? Again, we can't be perfect with sampling. I know people want to be, they hear that, but we can do our best. We can definitely look in situations and say, that's not right. And other situations say, that looks pretty good. What is the variable of interest? It's amazing how many people see information and never realize the variable. Now, in our class, you know, variable from algebra, people think of like X and Y, and, you know, it's a letter used in place of a number. Here, the idea of a variable is just simply what are you measuring? Are you asking people how much money do they make in a week or how much money do they earn in a year? What is the value of their car? How many credits are you taking this semester? All those types of questions, or again, those were all numerical type questions. What is your favorite sneaker brand? Do you have a yes or no favorability on a particular position? So there, it's not always a number type question. There's lots of types of questions, but what we're actually asking and the information we're getting, that identifies the variable. Are there confounding variables? Are there other things that might influence? You know, so if we're talking maybe about um, something about earnings, 
And then we want to conclude, well, hey, if you are a man, you make more money than you would if you are a woman. I mean, there's plenty of surveys and I was just seeing a uh, New York law that was just passed to try and combat that problem because that continues to happen. But maybe there are some other variables as well that we want to look at. Maybe in this particular job, it's a matter of education that there are, you know, there's gaps in education that we want to fix. So that would help fix that problem. So that's that's what we mean here. Just as there are other factors that might influence the situation as well. The setting and wording and surveys, I mean, again, that's such an easy way to get inaccurate or dishonest responses. It's so funny how the human brain goes after so many of those, those clues. If they see a positive word, it puts the brain in a positive setting. If they see a negative word, how that influences our answer. Are the results presented fairly? And that's where, again, is it do those results support the conclusion being given? It's a major problem in today. I mean, there's even a problem with a lot of the opinion hosts that we see on television. They don't even try and use data anymore. They just make very dishonest and untrustworthy statements and just say it as fact. There was a while it used to be difficult that they would show some very basic information and again, make one of those big grand conclusions. But that's not even the problem anymore. There's so much more that goes deeper. So just big picture. This is really just good for your own information to realize. There's a lot. Every time you're presented with something, there's a lot that you should be asking yourself. Not to say you should, I mean, is there is some good merit to saying, well, you challenge everything. But at some point, you should know that this is a reliable place and you can kind of trust them a little more. But you don't get that right away. You've got to build to that a little bit. So again, they keep going through the book, each individual guideline, trying to make that a little more clear. But the next big thing is, again, a little more discussion on bias, that there is selection bias, that here, a pre-election poll that surveys only registered Republicans will have selection bias, because if you're trying to get a opinion of all people, well, all people, there's independents, there's Republicans, there's Democrats. We want to see all of them. If we only see Republicans, well, then it should be very clear that our population is just Republicans. But how often we slide that, we use Republicans, but then we try and say something like, well, this represents everyone, when that is not the case. Participation bias. This is a really interesting one. Because when we do think about surveys, maybe it's something like a, like a Rate My Professor, like that website. That's a good source for a lot of students when trying to decide, well, which class should I take? Well, this professor has good reviews. This professor has poor reviews. Well, I'll take the class with the good rated professor. I mean, there's a lot of good information out there. And that's not a bad thing as a student to say, hey, that can help me decide which class I would take. It shouldn't be the only thing that you use to decide, but it's not terrible. But to realize, who fills out Rate My Professor? Or a lot of the other surveys, when you're handed a quick survey at the grocery store. Or you're asked, you know, when you, you buy something, maybe you're at a fast food place. And after, you know, they hand you a receipt and they point out, hey, don't forget the survey. They want, you know, those places want to collect information. And sometimes they're just doing their best. But to point out that a lot of these participation surveys, you get two people, that two types of people, two groups that will commonly fill those out. The people who feel very strongly in favor of something and the people who absolutely hate it. It's, it's tough to get that middle of ground type of opinion. So again, rate my professor. A lot of the students who go on there and rate, they're the people who really, really like the class and professor, and they want to share that with other students. Or they're the people who absolutely hated that class and professor, and they want to take a little opportunity to bash. And again, sometimes it's also to help share that information with other students. But it's tough to get that middle of the road. Again, you, you often get those two extremes. Okay, down at the bottom of page 303, they finally identify what is a variable, and it's an item or quantity that can vary or take on different values. So again, it's what we're measuring. It's what we care about. That's the point. We're going through a survey. We're going to collect data. The variable is the idea of what we're trying to collect. 
So maybe it's the number of shows that you watch, the number of viewers for a particular television show. If I'm looking at you in particular, maybe I'm asking you how many TVs you have in your house or how long do you watch television each week? You know, all these different types of questions whether those questions are asking us numerical type questions or categorical type questions, all those connect us back to the variable. And then last, oh, I'm sorry, it's our next section. We'll break down the idea of a variable to say when it is quantitative versus when it is qualitative. So that's it for this next section. So that's 5A and 5B. Combined, they give us a nice introduction to statistics. Again, what types of questions? Not a lot. A lot of it is just being familiar with the terminology, starting to get that first bit of experience. So as we go a little bit deeper, we're already thinking about the right things. We already know what are the, the places we should be careful. We're already starting to think about what are the extra details we should that we should consider. So, that's it for the first video. Again, make sure you go through the homework, start getting into that. You know, certainly it's not something I'm collecting on Monday. We'll do a lot of review on Monday before we get into a new section. And in 5C, we'll start getting a little deeper. We'll start to see once we have data, how we can summarize it with some tables and graphs. What is the right table to use? What is appropriate? You know, those types of questions. So on Monday, we'll get a little deeper, and that's where you'll start to see a little bit more of the traditional question and answer. But again, we had to get a good background. So get through the homework. When you get your book, read. You know, again, so many examples as I was flipping through. Just that little bit of reading will help reinforce the ideas and make sure you're prepared from this section. Okay, everybody, that's it. Certainly let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you all on Monday.